Well, for several weeks now, we've turned our attention to the Ten Commandments. And maybe you're just joining us, or maybe you've missed a week or two. Today we're on the third commandment. Commandment number three of the Ten Words of God. And I may have said before, I'll repeat myself throughout this series, but there are several ways that we wrongly approach this law of God. And one of those is when we approach it and think, oh, that one doesn't apply to me. I've not broken that one. I'm off the hook, right? And maybe this morning as we look at the third commandment, maybe you would say that of yourself. You would say that wrongly if you did. If you said it about any of these, you'd be saying it wrongly. But my hope this morning, pastorally, is to apply this commandment to us, maybe in a way that sounds new to you, I'm not sure, but to faithfully and rightly give us an understanding of what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. It may mean more than you've ever heard before, but then to encourage us to rightly live and apply this Word of God in our everyday lives. So you've heard it already in the corporate uh, reading that we did to now. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. This is the third commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name, or traditionally, who takes that name in vain. Let's pray that the Lord would bless our understanding of his word. <clears throat> Lord, would you be our teacher this morning? Would you open our eyes and our ears and especially our hearts to see and understand the holy standard of your word and the holy name? that is your name, and that you've given to us who believe. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, so what's in a name? Uh, let it be for the record that I am quoting Shakespeare here, because I have a few football illustrations in this sermon. But I started with Shakespeare. So non-football fans, bear with me through this. But what is, in a, what is in a name? You know from Romeo and Juliet, the question is asked when someone has the wrong last name. And the question is asked, well, what's really in a name? What matters is the person, right? What matters is the person. So what is in a name? It is a great question. Uh, you know that you, you probably are aware that the NCAA, starting this year is allowing for the name and the image and the likeness of college athletes to benefit the individual financially. This is brand new. It's never been done. And so now we have, literally, we have 18-year-olds, in one instance, old, who made a million dollars before they ever even played a snap in a college football game because someone wanted to use their name, their image, and their likeness to market a product, right? So this is now the norm. There's a lot to say about that, but not in a sermon. All that to say that names, images, likeness really do carry value. They mean something. Our culture has just indicated it with that. That NIL, that name, image, and likeness uh, matter. The Lord has said His name matters. And we are to handle and regard that name as holy in everything that it represents. I saw on businessinsider.com this week the tough products, fake products, and uh, I was going to share a number of them. Those, but I'll just share one or two. These are Chinese companies that are knocking off brand na name brands. And, and the, the one that is the most popular is Apple. P-L-E, Apple. And, and it uses the logo of, of what? An Apple. And them at a very, very cheap rate, 
a high phone or a high and if you're not careful it it will fool you it looks just like the iPad and it has the logo that's just only slightly altered and what the article said was these products look like the real thing you can be duped by them if you don't look very careful slightly altered logo or the the same font it looks like like the same same word, but there's an added letter, in this instance an H, make it Apple, iPad, or iPhone. And so we understand off, though it may look like the real deal, it's a phony product. And it cheapens the real product, right? It rivals the real product. So I have a few simple points this morning and a lot of application and some illustration. But the first is simply this. The Lord says that His name and all that it represents is holy. It's to be regarded as holy by us. We are the ones in the earth that will regard the Lord and His name as holy. We heard uh, in our opening passage this morning from Isaiah chapter 6, that emphatic holy Holy, holy, the thrice holy exclamation about our covenant-keeping God. He is holy and we are not, not, not all short. We fail in every way. His name is holy and it is to be regarded in every way as holy. Secondly, the Lord says, now listen, this is key. The Lord says He shares His holy name with His covenant people. Now that is nothing to yawn at. That is nothing to ignore. This is the beautiful statement of Scripture and what God says He does with His covenant people. He shares His name with His people. Do you remember from 2 Chronicles 7? If my people who are what? called by my name. You see, He shares His name. We are identified with Him. We are His representatives in the earth. This is a big deal, and you know it. Those of you who've been married, you got a new name at your, at your marriage, at your wedding. And it is significant to bear that family name. Your name changes. And that's what the Lord has said He has done in His holiness with sinful people. That is nothing to take lightly. It is significant to bear the family name. I've said to you before, and I'll say it again, some of you who are parents of teenagers or who were parents of teenagers or some of you who are teenagers, you've probably had a talk with your parents that sounded something like this. Now look, you're old enough to drive... And you're going to have opinions now. And that means you can go places and do things and say things. But don't forget who you are. Right? You have a last name. And you represent this family. Am I the only one who talks to his children that way? Surely you do this too. Right? You, you take the family name with you. And so if you're driving your car out there in Greenwood, don't be cutting people off in traffic honking your horn with the GPC sticker on the back of the car, right? It would look bad on the family name if you were doing that. And so that's true of all of us. We bear a family name. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have been baptized into His name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do you understand you have more than a sticker on your car? You are His representative. You bear the family name and you and I are well. In Numbers chapter 6, verse 27, I don't think I have this print for you, but you know this. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and you. Make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward peace. So they will put My name on 
on the Israelites, and I will bless them. It's putting the name on a people. You are a representative. You are an ambassador. Now, everything that you do matters. You don't do it for yourself. You are the representative of the Lord Himself. Amen? Amen. That's how weighty and how significant it is. Clowney, in his book, How Jesus Transforms the Ten Commandments, this. Jesus Christ gives God's name to Christians. We then bear that name in baptism, God's name-giving ceremony. We receive the name, the Son and the Holy Spirit. We receive the name of God as our own name, as our family name. And we then bear that name to the world. There's the sermon in a nutshell, captured so beautifully by Ed Clowney. And you see the meaning of baptism wed to a right understanding third commandment. Now, whether with a small or whether with a whether with a full grown adult, whoever the subject of baptism, the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the family name is given to that one. Let me say again, I've said it many times and I'm going to keep saying it. If you're one sitting there or watching here as a Christian, you have faith in this Jesus that we hear about every week and you've not been baptized, then you need to hear the call of the Lord to say, Come and get the family name. All the beauty, the meaning, the worth, the value of it. Don't deprive yourself, neglect yourself. What God has said is rightly yours. Why should you not be? Is one thing to consider. The family name at baptism, and it is our call for the rest of our lives to represent and Lord of Lords in all the earth. Point number three, the bulk of our time will be spent. The Lord commands to wear and bear His name well. If you're a Christian, if you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and you are now to wear that name well. You're to bear well in every Everything you do out in the earth, out in, in your work, in, in your play, in all. You can rewind that tape and we can start over, right? So if you, if in the family name, represent the Lord in the earth, and you and I wear and bear the name. So when I was in eighth grade, <clears throat> I played JV football for my school. They, st I'm sure schools still do this. Big game day was that you got to wear your jersey to school. Does this still happen? At least it does in football, I think. And how fifth grader, you got to wear the jersey to class to walk around everybody, and you're like, yeah, I belong. I'm on the team. I play football, right? You feel the weight and the in the southeast. So here's a true story. When I was in eighth grade, the first time that I wore that jersey, or if it was times, I can't remember that detail, but I remember walking to my school, and there was our head coach down the hallway, and I was proud of wearing this jersey, and my coach said, Mr. Patrick, what are you? I was like, Sir? He pointed at me and he said, you just trash on the ground. You turn that up. And then he gave me a speech. You see that jersey you're wearing? If you wear that jersey, you stop and pick trash and you make things better. And I remember being like, 
I just was excited to wear my jersey, right? I just got yelled at. But I'll tell you what, I remember that. I remember that point that he made was if you, that should mean something. You should live a little differently. You should give a, a better thick. You Little things should, so if you're going to wear that, that jersey, don't walk past trash. Who is that of, of us? Who wear the name triune God, your Son and Holy Spirit. And yet you and I at the grocery store and in the parking lot who don't return our carts. Somebody else will get it, right? And then we go get in our car that has G on it, and everybody's like, huh, never going to church there. No, we're not that harsh, probably. Maybe some are. We're to wear the name of God and bear it well in everything. It really should matter. It really should mean something. I woke up and read this, which is a very hard thing to do on a Saturday like this. But the article that caught my attention was that yesterday in the Ohio State football, in the middle of the game, in the second quarter actually, a linebacker was running onto the field to play, and a player on the field waved him off and said, no, no, go back, back on the side. And this senior, I have his name written down. Uh, let's not use it. We won't. He's shamed himself. He went back on the sidelines in disgust, and he took off his football glove. He threw them into the stands and his jersey. And he quit. He walked off the field and ended up being escorted off the field. And he then sent some horrible tweets and said terrible things about his school. Wish the best. And I saw that and I knew I was going to talk about the football jersey and wearing and bearing the name well. But can you imagine for that fan base and for that, the disgrace that he has brought by taking off his jersey saying, I want nothing to do with this. And yet, Christian life have felt like we wanted to quit. Or maybe it's off for a little while. I'll take it off at this weekend party for this week of vacation. Or I'll take it off there. I'll put it back on later when I want to. We're to wear and bear the jersey of God in all of its glory, in all of its weight. We're to represent Him in the earth. Take that jersey off. We don't bring disgrace to His family name. The Lord commands His people to wear and bear His name well. Therefore, and here comes the application. We are to hallow the name, and we are not to hollow that name. Now, what do I mean? Hallow, more of an old English word we don't use very often, but to hallow something is to make it holy, to regard it as holy. To hollow something, what do I mean there? Well, you've heard the expression, if something rings hollow, it's empty, it's weightless, it's insignificant. You see, we're not to take the name of the Lord in vain. What does that language mean? Vanity. You're familiar that meaningless, meaningless, vanity of vanities, the author of Ecclesiastes says. Emptiness, meaninglessness, hollowness, worthlessness. We take the Lord's name in vain. We're not to make it empty. We're not to make it we're not to make it trite and insignificant. We're to bring the weight of glory to that to maintain the weight of glory to that glory. So I mean, what are some practical applications? How do we hollow out the name of God 
and take it in vain and make it empty and weightless. Application that we do that, we make it hollow when we use it casually, when we use God's name cursingly, when we use God's name self-servingly, and when we live in what I call the bear hug of mediocrity. Let me, let me flesh each of those out. We hollow out the name. We take the Lord's name in vain when we use it casually or when we use it cursingly. So any name of God, any representation of God that we use flippantly in our speech. Now in our world, in our culture, this happens all the time, all around. You can't watch it without swear saying, oh my God, oh my Lord, any representation of that. Or using some reference of the Lord emphatically as an exclamation, Jesus Christ. Right? These are ways that we empty the name. We take it in vain. When we, like our culture, use it for self, for exclamation, for cursing, or for any addition to a statement that we make. That is taking the Lord's name and all of its glory and all of its holiness and making it trivial and light and meaningless. Do you understand that? Growing up as a child, I thought, I guess I was taught that the Third commandment, bless. Well, it may apply to that. But it's really more than that. It's the name and making sure that that one name of God is only shown in glory and weight and not trivialized. So it may be, if we live in a culture that trivializes the name of God and uses purposes, you or your children may find it just comes to the lips. It just out. It's just say, hey, when I'm playing a video game, when I'm sport, when I hit my thumb, when the cop puts the blue lights on and you see it in the rear view mirror, to use, to misuse the name of God. And the Lord says, don't use my name as that. My name is holy. It what people would say. You know, perhaps your son, you know, if, if they have that OMG comment or, or moment, they might say, oh, I didn't mean anything by it. I didn't mean anything by it. That's the point. The Lord says, do not use my name and not mean something about it. Only use my name with the weight and the glory that it deserves. Okay, also, we use God's name. We take it in vain when we use it. I know pastors who do this. I know Christians who do this. And I want to encourage all of us to never do it. And that is simple sounding as this. Like God told me to tell you, or I've been thinking about it, and I think the Lord wants me to tell you where you're using him to add weight to your point. Now, we can rightly say, you know, the scriptures say this. And so I think you should carefully consider fill in the blank. But I have seen these perverted, wrong-headed efforts to add weight to something a person says by saying, I feel like God told me, or I feel like God told me to tell you misuse of the name and God's people should not speak like that. We, we affirm what scripture to rightly apply it but don't use the Lord to try to make your point. Amen? Amen. And then lastly on, we take God's name in vain and this is the one that hurts. Sorry to bear this to you. We take it in vain when you and I are living in the bear hug of mediocrity. Now, what do I mean by that? 
I use this language a lot. I've probably used it with you, but in my own life, that, that mediocrity, half-hearted effort, when it gets a hold of a person, it gets them in a bear hug and does not, not want to let go. Okay, that's the, the bear hug of mediocrity. And Christmas, we need to live in such a way that we're always looking for the bear to sneak up and put us in his bear hug and not let us go. But when we give half-hearted efforts and we bear the pain, we are not, not honoring him as we should. If your reputation at work is that you cut corners, if you at practice, for those of you who are on teams, or that you go half speed, you fake it and act like you're running hard and you know you're going half if you're a plumber and you cover up your work with a little putty, or you're a contractor and you cover it up with a little drywall paste, that's taking the name of the Lord in vain, especially if you're in faith to market your product. I have a friend who once told me, he said, I am done hiring workers and and contractors and workers. He said, I used to go through the phone book and I would look, you know, who had a little ichthus uh, to adver advertise their Christians. He said, I've been taken in so many times by Christians, I'm more. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. It's using it for marketing and then falling short of the living God. You need to repent of all the mediocrity in our lives all the time, our half-hearted, our sloppiness, our laziness, because we wear and bear God in everything that we do. Now, that's pretty convicting, a real sense of, oh, wow, I didn't think I was taking the Lord's name in vain just because I never said it, but now I see that the way that I live is how I've been taken in vain. My work ethic matters. Who I am matters to God. And then that's our, our last point of consideration and application is how do we hallow the name? How do you and I hallow the name and, and show forth the holiness of our God? The way Colossians chapter 3 reminds us apostle, whatever you do work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord not for human since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. The Apostle Paul says, whatever you do, because you're, you do it with all of your heart. No more cutting corners. No more half-hearted efforts. And so there's four ways that I would apply to myself and to the church family for us to consider hallowing the name. The first is our work ethic, and I've already commented on it. For those of you who are students, I would say, right, that you should be known as, man, they work hard. They, they are not a corner cutter. They work hard in everything they do. Uh, the reflection reading this morning that a good name is better than perfume. What does that mean? That at the workplace, somebody brings a name, is it like perfume? Is it pleasant? Is it a sweet aroma? Oh yeah, that girl, man, they do good work. Put them in charge of that. They'll see that through. They'll do a great job. That is how we bring hallowed in the Lord's name. We honor him so that men and women can affirm that person's work ethic. They seek to honor the Lord when they do. I'll add to that another application. Ethic. Our recreation matters to God. You may not know this, but I was a therapeutic recreation specialist in another life. I studied therapeutic recreation at Clemson University. No jokes. But I do understand that our play and our play Play can be for the glory of God. It's not just our, it's all that we are. And we should play for the glory 
of God and bring hallowedness to His name. We hallowed God's name when we honor Him in our relationships with one another. Whether they're famous like we prayed about in the pastoral prayer or romantic relationships or friendships. God's name into those relationships. And so remember to wear and bear God's name in all of our life, the kind of people that we are in community with others. And then lastly, of course, we bear God's name. We seek to not take it in vain in our, our family and in our, our homes. We want to honor our children, their parents. We honor our older parents. Old and weak and need attention, we willingly grant that in love. And we are honoring the Lord when we do it. To not do so would be to take his name in vain. So this morning, I'm hoping you see this full orb picture of what does it mean to take the Lord's name into the earth and not take it in vain, but to take it and bring the weightiness of it, the beauty of it, the goodness of it, it, the worth of it. It is a beautiful thing and conviction of sin. Every one of us, myself included, this morning should say, you know what? I've been in the bear hug of mediocrity. That bear keeps sneaking up behind me, trying to get a hold of me. Or I've I've cut corners here, I've cut corners there. I've not been who I should be. Every one of us, we should rightly have a sense of conviction because that's what the commandments do. They show us that perfect image, that likeness of Jesus, who alone perfectly kept the ten words, commandments of God. And you and I will never perfectly measure up. But they are that standard of righteousness, calls us to. Calls us to be in the world and in the earth. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. If you don't have a passage of Scripture to meditate on today, or if you're looking for something to memorize, here's passages that sum up the gist of what we've heard this morning. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner of the gospel of Christ. In Ephesians 4, verse 1. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. And I'll close with this story. Familiar story probably to some of you, but it's the story of great. There's an old story passed down about Alexander the Great, who conquered most of the known world by his early 30s in the 4th century. Alexander was well known for his bravery and courage on the battlefield. The story goes that a traitor was brought before Alexander to be tried for desertion. Looking at the man who had been caught in a cowardly act, Alexander asked the man, What is your name, soldier? Alexander, sir, said the coward his eyes to the ground. At this, Alexander stood up in a rage. He grabbed the soldier by the neck and picked him off the ground, glared at him, saying, you say to me that your name is Alexander. No coward should share my name. He then threw the soldier to the ground, stood over him and said, you change your ways or you change your your name. I know it's true. I've heard it numerous times from numerous sources, but the point is true regardless. Some of us need to change our ways. 
we're wearing the name of God and we're not bringing glory to it. And the Lord says he will not hold anyone who takes his name in vain. The third word is change your name or change your ways. The good news is there is one who has perfectly kept that name of God himself bears that name of God rightly in the earth and his name is Jesus. He at broken sinners and he says, you have not been able to bear been called to do. But I have. I have purchased you through blood on a cross and by believing in me, you can have life in my name. Jesus does for sinners who will look to him in faith. And this morning we're reminded of Jesus. It is a sweet name for sinners. It's those who look to him in faith. Let's him. Lord, we give you thanks that you show mercy to those we name, even when we have not worn it or bore it well. Lord, we need a new heart and we need new life to be able to live in accordance with the family name. So, Lord, would you enable us, make us different people at work, different people at home, different people at play, people who seek to honor you in all that we do and say. And we pray it together in Christ's hope. Amen.